Hey everybody, Scott Stevens here with another perspective, and this is my first guest. I've made what is it, twenty-seven shows, solo. <laughs> I think you did, you probably did probably two hundred before you started uh, bringing on guests, Vicky. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and, and I've been on your show. We do your your coffee break show on Fridays at That's eleven right. Mountain Time. I'm Mountain. I'm just going to throw a Mountain. If you haven't figured out where a Mountain is, then you know we have math for that. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, so you can catch us there on Fridays, uh, every single Friday where they're doing a little wrap up of, of what's going on around the week, uh, around the world for the week. But specifically, you're here for a reason tonight. And Vicki, we've uh, been kind of working on this project. I've known you for a spell, and I've, I've been grateful that you've been as interested in economics as I have. And I, I don't know where it comes from. I was born with it. It's just something that I've, I've been interested in. I'm sure you're probably in the same vein. Uh, but we've got this book coming out. It's several weeks out and then a program along with it. And one of the things that we, we want to talk about and let people be aware of is that we both kind of anticipate that things are going to change in the not so distant future. Yeah. And we have to be somewhat prepared. You can have extra water for the hurricane. You can have your three day supply of food. But the changes that are appearing, whether they're mobs in cities, whether inflationary actions by the Fed, whether they're companies that have been in business for 150 years declaring bankruptcy, big changes are afoot. And That's we, so true. Yeah, we, we need to take protection for ourselves. No one, as you say in the book, is going to do it for you. So we've got to take these actions. So they're simple but they're absolutely actions that we have to take. And so uh, I kind of want to roll through a, a few slides and you chime in there. So I, I just kind of want to paint the picture of, of where we're going, because for me, it's important. And it's something that I know I've been preparing for for my entire life. Mm -hmm. And the reason that you you've been interested in metals, what, years? Yeah, like I 19. I, I probably have 40 years now in metals and hard assets. Four yeah. years. That, mm -hmm. yeah, that That's a track record. And I started, <laughs> it, it is, it is. And, and so I titled this protecting your assets from inflation, because when you blow up the money supply, inflation is the end result. I'm going to go back 110 ish years where the Federal Reserve took control of the money system. And instead of us circulating uh, debt notes like we have today, meaning the money doesn't exist until somebody takes out a car loan, takes a mortgage loan the government goes into debt, then that money can enter the system and circulate. In the previous generations, in the previous centuries, it was the miners headed to California for a gold rush that brought in a flood of money into the system. The mm -hmm. miners, you're going to hear that term a little bit later on when we talk mm -hmm. about digital currencies, the miners. Mm -hmm. So that allowed gold and silver to enter the monetary system and the economy grew. So where we are are some of these economists, these whistleblowers, these people that can see what's coming. And uh, Robert Kiyosaki, you know, he's been, he's an influencer. You would agree? Yeah, one of the best, I think, economists in the world, because he doesn't just talk about um, the economy. He talks about what you need to do to protect yourself. He talks about how uh, uh, having a financial education, and he spends countless hours yeah trying to educate the world financially so they can make better, more empowering decisions. And yes, the storm is coming. It's coming. The storm is coming. And I, I want to pretext this for today. We do have a book coming out. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. But it's not why we're talking That's about this today. Mm -hmm. We are talking about this because we want to take the next step in helping you prepare right now because the window is really closing. It's getting closing. And it's those people that are prepared now that are not going to have such a hard time and, one of these and can really benefit. And can benefit themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. And my idea is that we who have assets aside will be able to recapitalize on the other side mm -hmm. of the reset. Mm -hmm. That is key for me because do we want more war? Do we want more investment in strip malls? Do we want more investment in petroleum? Where do we want this fresh capital on the other side of this reset to go? And yes. those that can prepare for it, I think will have a bigger seat at the table ahead. And that is the kind of people that we want to be able to reach. So I bring up this tweet simply because the man 
was threatened and he publicly stated he was right. his life was threatened for yes. talking about this. That's correct. So this is the seriousness of the discussion we're having tonight. So why mm -hmm. did I do I say buy gold, silver and Bitcoin? A because I don't trust the Fed, Treasury or Wall Street. And neither should you. No. The game is rigged in their favor. Gold, That's silver, right. Bitcoin are out of their control. And that is why I bought silver when I decided mm -hmm. in 2003 I couldn't afford gold. I was probably wrong because I could have afforded it in smaller slivers. But I saw silver as an option because I could buy more of them than I could buy gold. I could buy mm -hmm. more ounces of silver than ounces of gold. So me, being a little math freak, I thought if I can get a times 10 on this... That's going to be a better return. If I could see silver go from five bucks to 50 bucks versus gold, saying going from 300 to 3,000. And we've seen that with silver hitting 50 bucks in 2011. So I was right in that regard. You know, it's interesting that you're saying this because I think it's so important. The first thing everybody has to know, everybody watching this, everybody alive on this, the first thing you have to know is that you can get wealthy from where you are, wherever you are, even if you think I've lost everything. I know I've gotten to a point in my life where I've lost everything. The thing about having a financial education and the right assets is that you can just rebuild right then. You can just rebuild. If you keep using the wrong assets, you're just going to get duped and there's no way out of it. And we're trying to help you understand how to get out of it and everybody can afford silver or some sort of Bitcoin something. or Alta, something. You can afford something that's going to start to help you generate uh, more assets. And we, we've been taught this buy and hold, buy and hold, mm -hmm. buy and hold. You buy at the top, you hold long enough, you'll, you'll get a return. But we're now seeing stocks, Apple, Tesla, that are approaching 1,000 times their mm -hmm. forward earnings. So. Yeah. These are these are numbers that I'm going to go out on a limb and it's probably a very fat limb and say that <laughs> these companies will never achieve that price to earnings ratio again in my life. We, we saw Cisco, Dell, Intel. Who were some of the other big ones? Uh, Compact, HP mm -hmm. kind of led the, uh, the tech uh, bubble back in 99, 98, 99, 2000. Mm -hmm. AOL was another big one. They've never been valued anywhere near the time when they bought Time Warner. Never. AOL, who even talks about that now 20 years later? True that. So we're, we're looking at companies. Tesla may not even exist 20 years later because you look at the competition that is now coming into the electric vehicle place. Uh, they've got much deeper pockets than Tesla does. So what we're saying is, as, as Robert says, the game is rigged in their favor and they want you in their casino playing yes. and being rewarded with their fiat money that they can go to the back room and bring out a wheelbarrow full of and say, ha ha, this is our game. You're playing in our casino. So in, in your works, Vicki, in, in the book that's coming, you talk about valuelessness. Yes. And at first I'm like, really? I can still buy milk with that. I can still <laughs> buy gas with that. It still has value because someone over on the other side of the, the trade thinks they're getting a good deal because they're getting paper money. Yeah, a lot of people think that, and it's unfortunate. But the truth is, back in the day, when money was backed by gold, it had intrinsic value. It had the value of the gold or the metal or the asset behind it. Then now, and we have an American hundred dollar bill here, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter where you are working in this world. We all work on this system now. And this is a key component. And when you're done, you have to ask yourself two questions, but let me explain it. And then I'll ask the two questions. One is, one is when Money is backed right now. It's not backed by anything. It is backed by the productivity of the country that it represents. That's key. It, that's key. It's that's backed key. by the productivity. So if you can say, what's the productivity around the world of countries? Well, if I look at China, I look at all the flooding there. It's flooded so badly. 
Uh, there's emergency services underwater, homes underwater, businesses underwater, manufacturing underwater. All of these things are underwater right now. That that level of productivity in that country is, it's not really there. And since they were the manufacturing hub of the world, you can see how manufacturing has been slowed down. Productivity has been slowed down around the world. It's not representative in one country. Mm -hmm. And we're scrambling right now between this virus and how do we get back to our economic standard? Mm -hmm. yeah. And those two things, suddenly you have to ask yourself, if productivity backs the value of the money I'm printing, how valuable is it? And the second thing is money the cash system that we have, we are forced to use. Yeah. You can't yeah. come up and say, oh, by the way, uh, I want to take this, you know, silver ingot and pay for my groceries with this silver ingot. They won't accept it. If you're not trading in fiat currencies, you are not buying or selling anything. You cannot buy, sell, or trade without using fiat currencies or mm -hmm. debt. There was a, a man, and, and his, his name escapes me, but he was the CEO of Overstock. Mm -hmm. And he could see this coming, and he wanted to pay his employees in something outside of fiat. There are other libertarians or gold bugs or yeah. constitutionalists also in Utah and Nevada who wanted to pay their employees yes. in, in, in coin. Something of value. Something of value. They wanted to give their employees something a value for the value that that business, that that owner received from their employees. And it only seems like that should be a fair exchange, mm -hmm. but, but that is enabled. So I'm going to bring in the next part of this because there was a time when our money actually had an intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. Instead of being paper notes, good for or a Federal Reserve note, just good for all public, all debts, public or private. But now you can't go to Bank of America and pay a mortgage with it. So is it really of value? And this is truly where that word, Vicky, valuelessness is now coming into play because the banks are saying, even though they can issue the money to go you know, into a digital ledger, that they won't take it. To pay your mortgage. So I'm going to go into, into coins. And my grandfather, a Canadian, would yeah. bring down, he, he gave me this a set like this. To, me to too. I had this. Yeah. yeah. And it was fun. And I it started, was. I was like eight or nine. And, and every little bit of change you got back at the store. And this was in the <laughs> 70s. And there was still the occasional silver something That's right. that passed through. Or even a penny that was Pre Lincoln, I think there were wheat pennies, or you know, there was something that was curious and something that was unique, and that had value to me. So I pulled it out of the wallet, I pulled it out of the the pocket, and I set it aside because it had value. So this is kind of where we're going today. We, yeah, we've been, we're talking about getting value back into money, and why that is simply necessary is because. Look at what's happening with the central banks. And it doesn't matter what country, what continent you find yourself on. The central banks have license to counterfeit their nation's own currency. But we cannot yeah. take the counterfeit currency because it's the law. That's right. And that, that's a powerful, that's the most powerful point. People are so upset, obsessed with getting money, 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 money. And they want that currency. They're like, show me the money, show me the money. You don't understand money comes in several forms. It's not just cash is not money. It's like trading stamps, the value of the dollar. If we were not the reserve currency right now, and if you don't understand what the reserve currency is, um, we'll talk about that in a second. But if we weren't the reserve currency, our value of our dollar is 3.5 cents, 3.3 and a half cents worth. That's even, that's the peso is stronger than that. So if we have the value of 3.5 cents, imagine having $5 million dollars and not being the reserve currency the next day, how much money would you have? Ooh. And that's the thing when I tell you about valuelessness. I mean, do you remember? I, you, most of you guys aren't going to remember S and H green stamps, but I, do. When I was a little stamps. girl. That's yeah, what. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. exactly. You get the green stamps, and you save enough green stamps, and you can buy something. Yep. That's yep. what fiat currency is. And the truth is. Currency around the world fluctuates in valuelessness based on the productivity. And right now, our productivity around the world is tanked so much. 
And what is what you're being forced to do is take these trading stamps over something of value. So let me tell you, you spend your day going to work and giving it everything, everything you have. And instead of getting something that holds its value, you're getting something that devalues excuse me, devalues over time. Guaranteed. It devalues to the point where you don't get a raise and most people haven't gotten a real inflationary raise for, I think it's going on 60 years, somewhere around there. The wage raises haven't matched with the inflation. And then the decline of the power of purchasing has just dropped and dropped and dropped. And people focus on getting the green stamps and the thing they want. And because of that, they're they're becoming broke. If you take this thing and you say, what asset can I buy that's going to keep up or outpace inflation, you start to make money. If you don't yep. do that, you'll use valueless money and then go purchase debt with valueless money and you're stuck in this cycle. And especially if you use a credit card, then there mm -hmm. is an additional cost on top of the inflation. <laughs> yeah, of valueless money. Of valueless money. And, and that's more of your labor. It's more, it's more, it's more for them. And they have needed, uh, in the description of the show, we talked about the, the endless expansion of the money supply is simply required for this, for the game to work. There's got to be new suckers brought in to keep the Ponzi scheme up. That's just the how it is. Yeah. And and when the Fed has an inflation target of 2%, remember Paul Volcker? My parents, we built our first house when we moved to Idaho. This was 1977. It took them 18 months or so to, to find a parcel of land. 800 bucks is what they paid for the acre and a half. And then they put up a house with an FHA loan for $28,000. Wow. And the house payment, I remember this stuff. I don't know why. was $208. That was the house payment. 208 but it was at 8% interest for 30 years. So mm -hmm. ultimately they paid for that house three times over before yeah. that 30 year note was, was settled with the bank with the, with FHA. So I 8%, that's kind of mm -hmm. been the target, you know, for me, interest rates are low. If they're sub 8%, they're high, if they're above 8%, but to have something grow at that kind of a pace or devalue at 8% every single year, made me when that was the same time or very shortly after where the hump brothers tried to chase and corner the silver market mm -hmm. bless their hearts i wish they had pardon me because that would have it would have bro broken the system so where we are in this ever expanding debt-based system we're coming up on a moment yeah and this is the moment that we all see coming. The banks know it's coming. The Fed knows it's coming. And they have found a can in the road and they have kicked it and they have kicked it. And they've even had a tailwind carry it down the road a little bit farther. I was fairly certain that this would have broken in 08 or sometime, some point in 09. And that's why I stashed silver back then, this moment of force majeure. Yes. And I, I want to pop in here and say why this is important, because I know a lot of you are out there thinking that you have purchased gold and that you are safe with the purchase of gold, that you have bought in these gold ETFs, and maybe you have gold in your IRA and your Roth IRA and some sort of investment plan where they have, you know, your gold is held in trust mm -hmm. uh, with someone. Um, but the reason we're doing this show today literally is because this week on the 24th, Bloomberg came out with... Um, you wrote this today or yesterday. Yeah, I wrote this yesterday as a literal. See, the issue I'm having right now is um, I used to be licensed. I had all the 6 to 63 to 26, all the financial licenses, and I could talk to anybody about anything. And I can't give financial <laughs> advice right here, <laughs> but I can, yeah. I can share or show people yeah. what other people that are, are saying and, and mold it so that I'm not breaking the law, but warning people and telling people about that. And I can share what I do. I can share what I'm doing for myself. And, you know, you can uh, go talk can to it. a fine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, this is so important because Bloomberg came out with this and, you know, maybe you can read yeah. it for us. Uh, and ETFs were kind of interesting to me because I was deep into silver then and it was a uh, 05 and 06 when those yeah. things were, were certified and allowed to be in the marketplace. And I had this 
what turned out to be a false expectation that it would be bullish for the price of, of gold. Mm-hmm. But they've got a, a, a little clause in there yeah. that says that they do not have to take all the money that is given to them and then purchase and then hold gold for those owners of GLD, of the Gold Trust. Could you could you read the Bloomberg read portion of that paragraph first? Because I think that's so important for them to understand. Bloomberg said gold fever in 2020 means plunging into exchange traded funds or ETFs. They now hold more gold than any central bank except the Fed. An exchange traded fund is a basket of securities that can consist of stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, or other financial assets. ETFs involve having a collection of securities such as stocks. They can also be invested in any number of other industry sectors or use various strategies. ETFs are similar to mutual funds, but they are listed on exchanges and ETF shares trade throughout the day just like an ordinary stock. And Mm -hmm. that's what makes them so accessible, as does their share price change daily. Gold ETFs are rising in popularity because they're easy to trade with and you don't have to put them in a safe at home or a safe deposit box in your bank. Now, doesn't that sound sound safe? It does. You Mm -hmm. would think. You would think. But what's the catch, Vicki? Right down there. You got it. <laughs> Keep Founding going. Partner CV CEO Oliver Garrett at Risk Hedge, Fu- Risk Hedge says, Spider SPDR Gold Trust, the largest, most popular gold ETF, is an investment fund that holds physical gold to back its shares. The share price tracks the price of gold and it trades like a stock. But the vast majority of investors do not have a claim on the underlying gold. The reason is that you can only request physical delivery of metal if you own a minimum of 100,000 gold shares. And most investors don't. And at $100 gold or $1,000 gold and 100,000 shares, that's well more than a million dollars. Even if you do own enough shares, the gold ETF reserves the right to settle your delivery request in cash. That's the very same cash that you bought the gold to to hedge against in the first place. And this is the thing, because I want to go back up to that first paragraph. The ETFs, ETFs now hold more gold than the central banks, except for the Fed. And I think the Fed owns like 26,000 or 26 million ounces, something along that line. I know know there's a 26 in there. So So it's a lot. So my point is, um, as most of you know, uh, my dad made his money illegally. And he, when he laundered money back way back then, he's passed away now, but when he laundered money back then, he used to tell me all the time, don't get anything. Paper burns. It's useless. Don't get anything that's paper. Always take possession of the physical asset. And that's what's happening. I mean, people think they're buying gold and they're buying a paper asset and the holder of the gold has that ability to do what we just looked at, which is that force majeure. And so what happens is they have the gold. And essentially for me, it appears as though you're helping them buy gold and they're, you know, chunking up on gold, but they may just give you cash back. And the question is, are they going to give you the value of the gold in cash? Because the value of cash is 3.5 cents. How much cash did you get back with the with the real value of it? I think it's dangerous for anybody to buy gold that doesn't actually have the gold in hand, the physical receipt of that gold or silver. That's the number one thing we can tell you. And then the other thing is we don't know what other kind of liabilities that that fund will have, whether they're legal, yeah. whether they're storage mm-hmm. costs. There's a yeah. whole list of other expenses, management funds, you know, management expenses. There's a whole lot of other expenses yeah. that are going to show up mm-hmm. and when, when all when they all show up at the door. The door is going to go close very, very quickly. And then you're left wondering, but, 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 but. You know, I owned GLD. Well, you did. Now you don't. Yeah. You don't. So let's move on because this goes into your your area of expertise. Certainly yeah. more than mine. I, I I am a silver fan. I declare it loudly. I like silver. Um, Me too. And I, only because on a weatherman salary, it was affordable. 
You know, yeah. I wasn't in a, in a big market. I was in a smaller place, and the world was looking a little hanky. And so I'm thinking, I want a little silver. And and I every Friday, every payday, I would go down. And this was this was nearly 2000s when silver was four or five bucks, six bucks was was high. You know, I'd buy t- a tw- around a 20 ounces, and I'd just do it, just as the 401k would get deposited every time. It just dollar cost. Averaging. Yeah. Way to go. That's good. Uh, first off, I love metals and, um, I started the fascination. My dad was a coin collector from way back when, and you know, the walking Liberty was his favorite. And I love the walking Liberty. I love the Morgan silver dollars. I love junk silver. I love coins because all of history is made on coins. But there are a couple of things that I want to talk about that most people haven't thought of. I didn't think about it. It's been, I've been 40 years in this industry. In fact, it was one, at one time I was one of the five women dealers in the United States that dealt in numismatics, (laughs) you know, and I was in the top three in the country. But when there's five, you know, the top three is like, well, okay, you're You're in the middle. (laughs) Yeah. But so here's the thing. Um, there's a lot of thinking that I've been doing lately. And one of the things that I noticed is if you don't know in 1933, uh, the time of the great depression, before we are headed into war, there was an executive order called executive order 6102. And the president came in and he kind of froze everybody's, um, bank accounts and everything else and said, you have to bring us your gold. And at that point in time, 1933 was the cutoff point. So if you had 1933, 34, 35, 36, 37, all your your, um, gold was confiscatable. But if you had 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, going backwards, Mm -hmm. your gold was considered numismatic value and they wouldn't take it from you. Mm -hmm. Now, numismatic value is coin collecting value, but it's in the the upper end because they're not going to make any more of those coins again. So everything forward was bullion gold that was made. It was just made by the government. And the key thing that I had to ask myself is, is it possible, is it possible that the government could reach out and freeze everybody's everything and confiscate the gold that is bullion gold from 1933 till now? And I've never once in my lifetime ever thought that could ever happen again. But just recently, the numbers coming back economically, everybody's talking about how they're lower than 1929. They're deeper than 1929, all these these indices. So the question came, yes, the question came, is it a possibility? And I thought, well, okay, back in 1929, we were millions, maybe billions in debt. I don't even know how in debt we were, but it's not $26 trillion. Oh, my goodness. It's it's so vastly different how in debt we are that even if they took all the gold, I don't think it would clear off the debt enough to do anything. I, I really don't. Does the possibility of freezing your bank account and then removing your gold happen? Well, let's go to 2008. How many banks were frozen? Was it Iceland, Greenland, Iceland that had the bank frozen there and people couldn't get to their money for a week? Um, And then, you know, we take a look at the collapses that happened in certain places where the banks went in and the government took money out to pay for the debts that are happening. And then there was kind of a feeling of austerity. Now, I know we can't ma- imagine that in the land of plenty. and um, But at the same time, we have plenty of debt as well. So the question is, can that happen? I think yes. And, and when the FDIC had to go in and rescue banks, straight mm-hmm. up, there, were, there were a lot of bank closures. There were consolidations. There were, there were forced and unforced mergers of small banks with larger banks. There was another collection. It was the big boys coming in and reducing competition for down the road as they all of a sudden Bank of America had another 30 branches because this other bank went down. (laughs) But how could they do that if they didn't have access to the Fed's printing press for someone to take on those bad loans? The troubled asset program, TARP. That's right. $787 billion. Again, that was just free money to allow the system to extend itself further. 
they're still buying toxic assets. They're still oh to this God. day, oh my they're still buying these toxic yeah. assets. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and they put BlackRock in charge of that. Uh, so they can buy BlackRock can use the feds money to buy their own bad debt. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. And in 2008, <laughs> I was ready for it to break because I wanted to be free of it. I wanted us to have gone through the bankruptcy to clean out the fraudulent aspect of fiat money mm -hmm. and let this country begin anew. Let's plow the field and start over. We could have been 12 years into this game. But instead, we've been able to kick it down the road. So we're we're kind of in this place where we're where we don't know how much longer we can run with an economy running on three of six cylinders. You know, how yeah, long can I, that go? I want to talk about that too because just a second ago you said something that was very profound. <laughs> and one is if your money was a value, if money was a value, they wouldn't go after your gold. Do you understand yeah. that? They're going after the thing that is valuable because this isn't. If, yep. they, if they do that. So uh, we've seen in 2008, just a decade ago, other countries do that. We did bailouts because that was our first thing. Then we did QE. But it's still done with valueless money. And when it comes down to it, if you have bullion, if you have gold bullion and you think, well, I'm okay, I, I have, you know, Krugerrands and I have pandas and I have maple leaves and those are the golds I have. I don't even own any American gold. Those golds are equally confiscatable. Yeah. The kind that are confiscatable is um, the kind of gold that is confiscatable is anything from 1933 forward, especially American uh, stamped gold mm -hmm. uh, that is in circulation. So but numismatic gold, yeah. and here's where we want to go here. This I want to let you know this is what I do, okay? <laughs> and I'm telling you, I am doing this. You can take it or leave it. But I buy numismatic gold only. And I like the kind that aren't confiscatable by governments. So the ones that aren't confiscatable that I really like is the gold French angel. Mm -hmm. And it'll go up and down in price. Uh, but the 1870, what is that? 76 75, or 75, 75, 75. And they're fractions of an ounce. Yes, it's they are. You don't have to come up with the full, the full thing. You buy these things in bits. Yep. Dollar cost averaging. Yes. And the, the thing about the, the angel is it's not confiscatable. It holds numismatic value. And it's a French angel. And the French angel is a non-confiscatable gold. So the way you can protect yourself is to buy that French angel or to buy that gold. And I love, you can you can get some on uh, varying eBay. different pieces. eBay, eBay, you can just type in French angels and they'll come up. Uh, Ampex does have them as well. And you're going to see numismatic values that are higher. Like if one is a rare date and it's really pricey, don't buy that one. You're looking for the cheap, you know, three to 400, maybe 450 range of gold right now based on its prices that you can pick up a fraction, a fraction of gold so that you're picking it up as you need it. Yeah. And, and shop around too. Mm -hmm. Really, really, th this is your, re these are your resources. This is your, this is the stuff you're throwing in the lifeboat. Because you're going to have to take a trip on the lifeboat. We're going to have to leave the big ship that's got a hole in it. At some point or another, it's not going to be under underway. And you have to wonder with these big negative numbers, you know, showing up Q1 was, was still a little positive, but showing the effects. But Q2, second quarter of the year globally, I, I came across a stat the other day. Um, tourism in Japan was down 99% for the whole month of July. Wow. Less than 3,000 visitors when they were expecting the Olympics to begin next month. Wow. So that's that, just amazing. Yeah. It, 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 this is, this is truly full stop and we're, we're coasting uh, the fed. I, I think we're upwards of $4 trillion that's been put out uh, a good fat part yeah. of that to help the markets, some to go into, into people's own pockets. Uh, other others will be lost forever, you know. So they're doing everything they can to keep this game together. The yeah, seams are it's not working. It's not. And this is the key thing. Right now, your green stamps. When you get your green stamps, you can buy assets like that silver or gold with that green stamps. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that you you want to buy assets. Stop buying debt. Yep. 
and and silver is the other aspect. Mm, uh, love gold, it. Gold is king's money. Silver or is people's money. That's it is right. The unit of exchange. We had pot. You know, a hundred years ago, the change in our pockets outside of the penny was silver. It's just the way it was. And even during World War II, the nickel became silver because tin was so valuable for the war effort. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can buy these in increments. Dimes was my favorite because there was a story, and I believed it, whether it's true or not, that uh, in the Depression, a man's day's work was a silver dime. That's right. So you're was buying, a dime. Yeah, you're buying a day's worth of labor. And, mm -hmm. and money is nothing but compressed time. It's somebody's mm -hmm. time put into a unit of exchange. And that unit of exchange can be gold, it can be silver, or it could even be something as crazy and new as digital currencies. I got to tell you, I'm interrupting right now, and I want everybody to hear me. Whether you like it or not, want it or not, or know it or not, this digital currencies are going to be the future. Yep. That it's, it's the digital currencies that are going to be the future. Why? Because no matter where you go around the world, the productivity level that is hooked to the currencies that exist are not going to make it in the future. Mm -hmm. They keep devaluing. We have a currency war going on, which is the, the, the deliberate devaluation of money. Nobody's coming by. I know there's a lot of people who say, well, Donald Trump said he was going to put the possibility of the dollar going back to gold. It would be a great idea, except that we have $26 trillion in debt and we don't have enough gold in that $26 trillion worth of debt to back it up or erase that $26 trillion worth of debt. So right now, Bitcoin is on the move and I'm going to tell you what I, I do. I'm very heavily invested in cryptocurrencies and I enjoy that as an asset. It's been very good, very, very good it's to me. Good. It's been good. And I want to throw yes. Reese's comment up here uh, because you know, it was a play off my parents in 1977 when they built the house. Uh, we had an FHA loan at 9% interest for a $28,000 house, best investment ever. And this last month, the average sale price of a home in the United States for the first time ever crossed $300,000, even amidst yeah, the pandemic. Wow. You know, people were wow. willing to, to spend the money that they had on that house. And who knows how many months, years, that the value of the average home in the United States will stay above $300,000. Yeah. Uh, uh, it may not be very long. And then you're still on the hook for the mortgage but at least the mortgages are cheap. And that's kind of the way people are thinking right now is if I can afford the payment, I can afford the house. And when interest rates go up and it is inevitable that they will go up because interest rates are directly related to the counterparty's ability to pay. Mm -hmm. and if we have an economy that cannot afford to pay the debt, those who are lending are going to demand a higher interest rate. It's just mm -hmm. how the market works. So we could see the United States, who had an incredible five-year auction today, at one plus percent. I mean, low one percent. So somebody in five years has given the U.S. government billions and billions of dollars and is only expecting a one percent return per year mm -hmm. for the next five years. And it's possible that the government may not even be there in five years with the way things are going. So. Well it's interesting that you say that because right now it's well known cities are starting to become bankrupt. We're not, you know, they're already on teetering. Some of the cities were already teetering on that. Uh, but we don't see tax dollars coming in from businesses that are usually open and people buying and spending. It's not. Remember, the value of the currency is related to the productivity of the economy. If their economy is doing well, and people are producing and things are selling, that money gets stronger. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> and then they're devaluing that money along the way so they can pay off that debt. This system, no matter what you say, is not sustainable. But more than that, you only have two choices in your life. That's it. When money comes in, you're either going to buy debt or you're going to buy assets. Well, Which yeah. one is going to give you money? That's it. You have two choices. It comes in. Yep you are going to buy an asset or you're going to buy debt. And, and Lori's kind of an in, interesting place. In hey, area. Lori, nice to see you, my friend. You know, where I was, you know, doing the, doing the nine to five, or for me, it was uh, two to 11. Uh, well, 
how much do you buy? And and the yeah. answer for me was I kept that checking account low because everything's surplus and, and I didn't buy a lot of things that I would have liked to have had because there was this need to collect. It was like the squirrel in September knowing the winter's coming and the tree was full of nuts and it was time to go get those. It was time to start stocking these things up. And once you do it and once you begin, it becomes in a way addictive and it's fun. And that is the cool thing about cryptocurrencies is that you can do it $20 at a time. You can do it mm-hmm. over and over and over. And it becomes rewarding because you're taking care of yourself first. And we're yeah. used to giving and giving and giving and giving when you need at times to watch out for number one. Yeah, uh, being able, and Lori, I want to talk about this place that you're in right now, because I've been there, done that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I always do when I'm in that way, I start to turn it around. I remember I just spent $5 on silver, back when silver was $6. Uh, an ounce. I think it's like, what is it? $25 now, something 25, like that. 25 to 30. Yeah. Uh, dollars uh, for a ounce of silver. And what happened for me when I bought that one is I suddenly felt like I had turned a corner. Then I waited. I had to wait another month before I bought another one. Then I bought another one. Then I bought another one. And I just kept buying it. And then I bought junk silver, etc. And I understand the difficult part right now. This is the part that bugs me the most because, Lori, you are not alone. There are a lot of people in this world who are no longer able to take their surplus money and invest in gold or even have surplus money. They have to somehow make a little adjustment and buy silver first because silver is so, so it's so much uh, less expensive than gold to buy, but it is the stepping stone to buying gold. What I would, what I would do if I was in your place is I would invest maybe $20 a month in a cryptocurrency and I would buy some silver. I would invest, even if I had to split a $20 bill and go, okay, $10 worth of silver and $10 worth of of crypto. crypto. And you have to educate yourself. You can't go in and go, I like the way that one sounds. Let me just buy that one. (laughs) That works for wine, but not necessarily for cryptos. (laughs) You do have to educate yourself. Uh, The first thing I'm going to suggest is... We have a new book coming out. It's Sink or Swim uh, uh, 2030. It's a a guide to help you get through the next decade. The first thing I would do is read that. I'd also read or listen to uh, Robert Kiyosaki's podcast because he's about financial education for the average person. And what we have to do is learn how to take the green stamps we get. And that's how I see dollars. When dollars come in, I see green stamps that I can turn into assets or I buy debt. I buy assets or I buy debt. And the other thing is you can buy an asset or build an asset. That's the only two choices you have. You buy it or build it. So you can buy a house, you have an asset. If you build the house, you have an asset, but you have to, you know, know how to build a house. And you've been built and you've been building your own brand, Lori. Mm -hmm. With with your photography, you've built a brand. Yes, you have. Hey, Paul. Paul, oh, good presentation, background in accounting and finance. I can tell you the precious metals market is telling us that the fiat system is extremely vulnerable. While That's right. Always overcorrect. And uh, my re- refutation of the efficient market hypothesis, the trend is your friend. Hey, that works in weather too. Metals <laughs> are broken out of my recommendations to hold physical, easy, easily recognizable coins. Yes. For some reason, platinum is a big laggard of the current time. We'll go on, but I'll leave it at that for now. Nice, Paul. Thank you for that. Yeah, and and platinum. I I haven't played in those areas. I just never had the the capital to go to go playing with those other metals. I just I, I stuck to the two. You know, mm-hmm. they all have industrial value. There's there's we we were looking at pictures earlier today uh, about computer chips and harvesting the pins that these CPUs you know sink into the motherboard yeah. and they latch it down. That those are gold because of its conductivity and they're harvesting that gold. And when gold goes to 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 10,000, 15,000, it's not that gold is going up in value, it's just that the dollar is going down in value. 
That's what's happening is the and dollar I, is worth less and less and less and less. I want to go back to Paul's statement because he made something that is direly important. It's direly important. So you want recognizable, he said, recognizable silver. So if you're not a numis numismatist, which evidently he has some experience with coins because he said that. When he said this, um, you know, hold physically easily recognizable coins. So if you don't know what a, a bust, a, a half dollar, a bust dollar is, don't buy it because it's not easily recognizable. People think it's old. If you buy uh, peace dollars or some really Morgan silver dollars, even raw, they can be cold. They, they can be washed or whatever. You're just holding the silver value of them. Mm -hmm. Make sure they're easily recognizable. Most people know what a peace dollar is, you know, and most people know what a Morgan dollar is. Uh, Paul, that was a really great statement. And if you're into numismatics and you're buying numismatics, you have to be very good at what you're doing because you can overpay very easily. Yeah. Thank you for that, Paul. That was a really good insight. Yeah, really. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I, I'd get, I didn't stay, I didn't do numismatics because I felt the price premium was, was greater that I could have gotten a, a, a more return on just, just mm -hmm. buying stupid bullion and the confiscation part. I didn't consider this was, you know, early 2000. We'd just gone through 9-11. And I'm like, they're not coming for my gold. They've got oil. They've got no, oil. they're not that, coming for silver. So no. if you have silver. You're, you're good. But yeah. then I realized I had this silver. I'm like, bloody hell, this is heavy. This is heavy stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm 20, so digital currencies are just were delicious. Me, the computer geek, the kind of guy who liked numbers and computers, when I first read about uh, Bitcoin back in, uh, boy, when was it? Probably 2014 11, 11. or? Uh, it was 15. Uh, it was 14 I, for me. Yeah, when I got the guts to, to pull the trigger and buy. And, and I haven't looked And it back. was 15 because I bought them the year you did. Yeah, yeah, it was 15. And, and they were. See how long we've known each other already. We're up 20 times. Yeah. Well, more than that. But uh, that's just, th we're just getting going because the floodgates are still open to the Fed. They're still printing money. What is Donnie yeah. saying? Yes, this is alarming that we're entering the possibility right now, right? The value of the gold cannot clear the debt unless we devalue the dollar to where a dollar now is worth a dime or a penny. We just whack off two zeros, mm -hmm. 23 trillion or more. We've entered the twilight zone on all levels. And I'm sure we'll, we all we all took a wrong term coming back from Puerto Rico and entering the Bermuda Triangle. And here we are in the reality. <laughs> indeed, Mr. Gifford, indeed. Yeah. So anything else you kind of want to hit, Vic? Let's see. What, what yeah, I want to stop over here. Christopher Johnson on the bottom there. Pop that yeah, up. Wow. A down. 1903 dime was found a foot deep next to my mom's right. in 1896 home. That's cool. That's that exciting. Is cool. That, that is, is exciting. Cool. Christopher. Oh, Christopher. Good to see yeah. you. Yeah. Printing Love this. For, has, printing money for the last 12 years has not helped us. You got that right. Those who are printing might argue, but maybe with the wisdom of the dozen years behind them, they'll realize that we should have let go of it back in 2008. Yeah. We should have let go of it and let this thing get away from us and go through a bankruptcy. And yeah, then, we'd be on the way to healing right we, now. We would be there. We would have a new yep. currency. But then I don't believe we were in a position to where we would have changed the leadership. The bankers would still be the bankers. They would just have a new currency free of debt and able to exploit for maybe another hundred years. So maybe this is all playing out just exactly as it's supposed to, that we've got enough turmoil, enough wokeness, if you will, in society to be able to begin to call out the inequities, to begin to call out the militarization of police, to begin to turn the soil a little bit so that when the system does break, the soil is ready to receive another set of seeds and take a different harvest. And, um, and that, that in a way, Vicki, that's what we're here for. Yeah. Uh, let's pop Glinda for. up there. Glinda. Is she down yeah, below? Glenda Parker. Oh, yeah. Is. Want to talk this? to her before that hurricane goes over. We're praying for you, sister. Yes, let's see. So silver. keep this junk silver. You betcha. Yeah. 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 Buy a little bit more junk silver, please. Dimes, nickels, quarters, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is, the silver will have some value. Because yep. they'll, they'll be this, in meteorology terms, <clears throat> there's this boundary layer between a warm front and a cold front. There's turbulence. There's lightning. There's thunder. There's rain. Yep. Rain is tears. You know, there's, there's sorrow. There's a transition from one state of being to another. And we are going through that right now. 
and we, we can see it in society, we can see it in the financial systems. It doesn't matter how many debt relief programs that the that Congress passes, all they're doing is creating more debt and calling it debt relief. It's yeah. just from one ledger to another ledger. It never goes away. It's still dirt in the room. We just putting it over in the corner over there and maybe yeah, it'll we'll go keep away. kicking the can down the road and we hoping do. it'll go away. It's not gonna go away. And that's the important aspect of talking about this. This is so important. I want you to know, um, Scott and I have been friends for like, God, over a decade now, but the important thing that happened for us, this isn't our first gig together. It's not like we just got together and said, let's write a book together. You know, we looked at each other and we were like, we have to tell as many people yeah. as we can. How do we we tell have to tell as many people as we can, because when you hear about the hurricane coming and Glinda, no, no pun intended, those in the way of the hurricane, when you hear about the hurricane coming, it gains force as it comes in. It gains force. It starts spinning and it goes from a one, a two, a three, a four. And we know four and fives are devastating. Well, the financial, the financial hurricane that's coming the cyclone, the tornado, the earthquake of it all is huge. It's huge. And there isn't somebody who's coming to save you. There, there isn't. And I want to be so clear. It's just like today on Scott's weather show, Scott was like, they put this sign up. If, if you're there and you need help, don't call. We'll be there and, you know, put your next of kin and things and put it in a plastic and put it in your pocket. Yep. Uh, ID I mean, your body. That's yeah, really what it is. ID that's your IDing body, so your body. Who you are. That's right. Because, because some along some way along that journey, a decision wasn't made in the proper time. That's and right. That's what we're talking about is getting ready before there's a line outside the numismatic store, outside the gold store, outside. While eBay. there's still junk silver on eBay. <laughs> yeah, while it's there and it's delivered to your front door or you just open up and start the Coinbase app and, and connect yourself, go through your ID, connect your bank account and begin the process. Mm -hmm. Because when the herd shows up, it's because they heard about what's happening. And they finally got the fire underneath them because that fire is creating change and it's finally forcing them to move. Because if it's comfortable, we don't move. And this COVID thing yeah. <clears throat> in many ways is a blessing because it's a shot across the bow and allowing people to realize that the status quo is changing. Yeah. And it's changing and we're not going to go back. The restaurants are gonna, aren't going to open. And without bailout money, the airlines would be closed. Yeah. They would, we would have maybe one airline and maybe it'd end up being a nationalized airline. American Airlines now owned by the U.S. government, you know, just like in so many other countries, Aeroflot in Russia, you know, you know, Air <coughs> France. These were all national airlines. Maybe that's what's going to happen. But nonetheless, there are far fewer companies operating at the end of the road. So many companies right now are, are open because they have access to debt. And in fact, I, I can't remember if it was Business Insider or Forbes, but the, the statistic said that 70% um, of the corporate defaults that happened last year were American companies. Mm -hmm because they were so heavily in debt. And so the corporate debt that the corporate debt, uh, thank you, Paul, uh, <laughs> the corporate debt that we have is equally as scary. It's like um, the companies that serve are so dependent on debt that their profitability is zero, really. Mm -hmm. They're just, zero. they just keep getting bailed out or getting that line of credit. And when that pony stops, we're going to see things that are just, wow, huge. This is one comment that uh, really motivated me to get into Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. Was that I was investing in generational money, money that would grow to the extent that with half, yes. of, one, half of a Bitcoin, it would be enough for after the reset for me to live on and then to will, to give, to donate, to deal with a foundation. There's the next leg up on Bitcoin is going to leave us uh, in in six digits, 
And yeah. that may just be another launching pad. And ultimately it will be as the system uh, begins to reset. And it's, it's my sense that all governments, at least the ones left, will end up all with digital currencies. There'll be no need yeah. to print and we'll use decentralized. We'll exchanges. have one, we'll have one currency that there's no trading and, you know, yeah. having to see whose money is stronger today. And, and that's yeah. a silly game. Why would you want to divide your currency and the, and the labor of your, of your employees, your, your taxpayers? It, 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 we should really be angling for a stronger currency. It is probably the only sovereign game where weaker is the one that is sought after. It's mm -hmm. backwards. So yeah. thank you, Vicki. I think we covered a little no, bit of territory you. here. And, yeah, uh, I just want to be open. I know I'm more serious than I usually am on the Coffee Break show. And it's so, you know, it's really fun to work with you. It's really fun because I have such commonality with you. But this is such an important, serious conversation. It really is. And Risa, cryptos are, are, are fun. I'm going to recommend a documentary if you've got a YouTube subscription or access yes, to- Yes, everyone, uh, re let, go to this documentary, you know, which one he's going to, I've watched it. it. It's the rise and rise of Bitcoin. It's six years old now. Uh, Roger Ver is a, is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it just talks about when, you, when you're able to take the creation of money out of the hands of government, that it can finally work for you instead of working for them. And that excites me to absolutely no end because I, I, I know that we have all been laboring under this, this tax of yes. fiat money, this tax of inflation, taxes, all mm -hmm. of it. And the system doesn't have to be set up that way. In my ideal world, we can abolish the IRS and we could go to a flat tax, a flat sales tax that's collected at the register and on the blockchain sent to whatever central authority is there. And that's it. There's no need to file. There's no need for anything. And then everybody pays their fair share. And then it's done. There's no worries about audits. There's none of that. And then the government would absolutely have to live within their means. And with a blockchain, with the government, and you when you put those two hand in hand, then you have accountability. And that gets me going. Because then there's no... $2 trillion missing the day before the Pentagon is, is <laughs> yeah, running. You're like, where'd airplane. that money go? Yeah, no, come on, we have it. <laughs> we, it would all be auditable. And that is the future. That is mm -hmm. the future. It's coming. And so that will result in a wholesale change in governments, the responsibility of the government to the citizen, and then the citizen to the government. There'll be a contract which will be enforceable just by blockchain rather than by um, audit law. Firm. I know. Talk about accountability, huh? Yeah. That blockchain is coming. There's a it's lot coming. of corruption that is going to die. Yep. It's going to, it's going to take us there. And that's um, right. I don't know if we're ready for it, but it's coming. It's kind of yeah. like everything. I don't know where I'm ready, but it, it, it will arrive. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks for uh, stopping in. Uh, look, good to see everybody in there. Uh, nice discussion, Vicki. I, I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Really, it was really, really fun. It. Yeah, it yeah. was good. And uh, the project's coming out. You'll see it uh, in the weeks ahead as it gets ever closer. Uh, we get it through editing and, and other things, and then uh, it'll be presented. And probably not a minute too late. Right. Yeah, we got to get it to our final. The final one to the publisher is on the way, and so yeah. it'll be soon. That's exciting. All right, have a great night, everybody, and I'll see you next Monday for another perspective, and we'll see where we go because uh, – I'm kind of thinking it's going to be a weather climate kind of week with the cold that looks like it's beginning to form up north. We'll see where that goes. And uh, anyway, it's always yeah. always subject to change. But, uh, you know, me, the weather guy, I can't quit, quit looking up. <laughs> All right. See you soon. Have a great night, everybody. Oh, one more thing. We have other yes. shows here on our on our little Metadime channel, our network. <laughs> and I want to throw that in there just because, you know, I, I, I could see us on Friday <laughs> because you could. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's bring that baby up. It's not too far away. So there's your coffee break show. Uh, Tracy Wilson has her unlocked show on stateside time. It's a Tuesdays and Thursdays, six o'clock mountain. I'm just giving everything a mountain because, you know, my tongue is about done for the day. And then uh, <laughs> this show at six o'clock mountain Mondays and Wednesdays. So that's kind of our lineup. All right, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow and we'll see you tomorrow morning on the coffee break show. Vicki, have a great night. Bye.